So the moral of the story is test it and test it and test it because you have a device and things might look great on your device. You're thinking that you're targeting your device. Um, and I happen to have some other devices. Uh, a friend gave me this Android one, 2.3 for free. And I pull it out sometimes just to see, just to test with it because I could, um, you know, I, I could stand to see what it looks like on an older device as well. And then this, um, this one used to be good a couple of years ago. Now I, I'm seeing that it is laggy, but it still works. It's showing the map. And then I've got the new device. Well, an alternative to actually getting the physical devices is also the, um, is also the, the emulators. I want to bring to your attention, however, another. Um, another emulator solution um, that perhaps for some people will work a little bit better because it's browser-based instead of using the uh, virtual devices. If you look up Ripple emulator, Ripple emulator, this is apparently still in beta. Um, an emulator that, through the Chrome web browser, creates like a virtual Android device with different specifications. And then you can load your projects in that emulator and um, have another way to test it. Because it's all about testing it, debugging it, alpha testing it, beta testing it. And the more you do, the better because then you get the perspective, as much perspective as you can on your device that is going to go out to millions of devices, millions of potential users, and dozens of platforms and variations and so forth. So if you can get more testing, that's more better. The Ripple emulator. So uh, it attaches to Google Chrome. I'm going to test it out for a moment. Add to Chrome. It's like an extra plugin that gets added to your particular Chrome installation, and I will say go ahead and add it. Ripple Emulator Beta has been added to Chrome. Use this extension by clicking on its icon. Manage your extensions by clicking Extensions in Tools menu. And Tools is the little hamburger menu. So in theory, as I visit websites or load web content and then I activate the the ripple emulator enable so then it's going to load up you're seeing this window because this is the first time you've enabled for this specific URL please select the platform or runtime I want to go with um, it only seems to go up to Cordova 2 Mobile web, let's do Cordova 2. And so then you get this device. You have various options on the on the side. What kind of device? This is a generic one here. Um, you could even do, you know, iPhone devices, iPhone 5, Nexus S. So you can browse. You can browse websites with this. It's not perfect, but this is another way to um, to test. This has a geolocation feature, so in theory you can feed coordinates into it.
so it's not quite letting me open my project in the emulator, but I don't know if it is. Reloaded? So you open it here and then press the, the button and click yeah. enable and then reload? It doesn't seem to even respond to me, but I'm going to reload it. Huh. Well, I'm going to assume it does work because it works for at least one more other person. What's that? It does work. It does work. So I'm going to assume it works for, if it works for at least one person, it works for other people. Did it work for anyone else if you tried it? So um, I'm just showing you there's another example there for um, working with uh, emulators and such. And the theory is that you've got this Ripple, Ripple emulator and it's supposed to mimic having a virtual device um, to some degree. It's not perfect, but it's been around a while. The project's been around a while and it's pretty useful. So there, at least I'm opening that. How did you get to that page? Well, this is this is my online example, so I just went to it that way, and it's supposed to open my version right from my flash drive, but it, for me, it's not doing it. So, if you just still want to play with it, you can go over to my example project there. After after I load a ripple, I have to close. Chrome and then um, open the project in Chrome, and then the extension kicked in. Hmm. The first time it wouldn't load like 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 what happened here. Okay, so I'll close. I'll, I'll follow your process. I'll close Chrome completely. <laughs> so yeah, then somehow the extension won't kick in unless you relaunch Chrome. And then from here you open the. Yeah. The project. No, just close Chrome and then launch this um, open the index file. So it opens Chrome on its own. And then, right. it'll, then it'll work. Right. Well, I'm having bad luck. <laughs> My stars are unaligned now. So, okay, it worked for at least two people, so it works. And um, there's probably some other quirk. But anyway, that's another way to test your de your your projects because it's all about testing it. Uh, I believe I said before uh, the adage I forgot where I got it from, but uh, there's there's no there's nothing foolproof because there's just so many ingenious fools, and so you think you're you're de you're doing your development, you've covered all the bases, and then something else happens that you didn't expect. So those ingenious fools beat you again. So uh, it's all about testing. There's still more stuff that we're going to add to the app that's going to be in part three of the class. I want to add, um, well, let me show you here. Let me show you this example of what we're going toward in part three of the class. So this is a previous this is a previous uh, semester, very similar to to this one, of course. Um, but the big thing is that this has something called my classes. So you'll be able to go to my classes. Uh, needs fine-tuning, of course, but uh, you add information like class 1, 2, 3, which is Android 1, taught by instructor Campos. You 
add it. And then here you're, you're storing class information, the CRN number, the class, the instructor. This, of course, can be made prettier, but then let's say, and then the icons are getting cut off, but the center one is to add a class, the right one is to show the classes, and then uh, the left one is to clear the fields, basic stuff. But then below it, which again will make a little prettier, is um, you can delete a class. Let's say you no longer want class 1, 2, 3. Delete CRN, and then it goes away. Uh, let's say you wanted to edit a class, uh, actually class 1245. So you've got class 1245. That's actually, uh, I misspoke. It was English class taught by instructor Smith. Update. And then that's been updated. Okay, basic stuff, but that's databases. That's a form of databases here. We can save as as many fields as we want, of course. Here we've got three fields. Uh, we can um, edit or delete the content of our database. Um, and there's many more function, much more functionality we can do to it, but getting to this point, of course, you know, requires several dozen lines of code because everything that we do, every bit of functionality of any website or any app is lots and lots of code and logic and all of that. Um, so that's what we're going towards, and this is going to be saved. Notice I've got class 1245 and 1920. If I, if I exit the app and completely force quit it, and then I relaunch it, so I started the app brand new, um, go back to my classes, this time show classes, it's still got the old classes. So you say, yeah, so what? They're, it's supposed to work like that. Of course. But the to get it to, to work to do something like this requires the effort and the programming and the right code and the logic and everything. So this is building upon, in a sense, what we learned with local storage. But it's better than local storage. Local storage is just a key value pair. One variable name, in a sense, and one object inside of it. We're going to work with something else, which I'll preview for you briefly in a moment if you want to start to explore it. But when we come back on the third part of the class, we're going to start week one. We've got this great app so far. Now I want to start adding that. That's going to take us a week. And that's something called PouchDB. So let me briefly show it to you, and then we'll get into it in detail in the next class, because there's a couple more things I want to do before we wrap up this class. If you want to explore, you can open up the website PouchDB.com. PouchDB is part of the modern, flat databases that are popular, the NoSQL databases. Um, so in a sense, then, it could be limited for some people, because if you're used to SQL, you know, MySQL or SQL, uh, MySQL or SQL, you, you have relational, you have a relational database. This is one of the, the, the styles of databases where there, it's not relational, but it's JavaScript-based, actually. So it runs in the browser. It, um, it has the syntax that you might be familiar with, uh, like JSON format. And it's very straightforward. All the APIs are documented here. It's an offshoot of CouchDB, which of course then we'll explore what's that about. But in short, we'll be able to uh, save records with more than one field, whereas local storage only had one field. So very briefly here, var, create a variable, db, my whole database is that variable. It's a new object, a pouch db object with an internal name of db name. Then if we want to put something into the database, we have the built-in method put. So we're saying db.put. And what do we put inside? Well, we need an id at least, underscore id. Every single object in the database needs some unique identifier, so you have to have some sort of ID. It could be anything. It could be an email address. It could be a first name, a last name, a date stamp, anything. After that, you can put whatever you want into it. In this case, the unique ID is, the, is an email. Um, then we've got a field of name and a value of David, and an age, 
field and a value of 68. So we've added a record. Then, of course, we'll see how to update a record, delete a record, show a record, etc. Here is just some very simple, um, if there's any changes to the database, we'll do something. At the moment, just a console log output, but it could do other things like make an alert box appear or ask you for the next record or whatever, but it's monitoring for changes to the database. And then what's even cooler is that if you've got then a cloud infrastructure set up, you can do db.replicate2 and this database, which will only exist on the device by default, will then get replicated to an online database, a CouchDB powered database. So your database in, in total will be replicated over to some online service. The great thing about that then is someone is saving these classes or saving their, their running information or saving their nutritional information or their dating history or whatever, and then they're logging in and they save, and that's being saved to the cloud. They switch to a new device, they log in to that new device, and then it can pull that data out of that database with db.replicate from, and it takes it from the cloud um, repository back to this device, and your data is synchronized by device. At the very least, we'll have the data saved to your device, and it's, and it's permanent. Uh, much more advanced is to get it to, to migrate with you from device to device. But if you want to start exploring it when, a when part three of the class starts next week, um, this is what we're going to start to look at on week one. Uh, it's cross-browser, lightweight, easy to learn, open source, developer community is very open. I've talked to that guy right there, Nolan, he's one of the guys behind it, and he's given me tips, and I've helped a little bit on their GitHub. And so it's a, cool, it's a very cool project. It might not solve every problem that you might have. It might be limited for some features that you're looking for. There's many ways to skin the digital cat. This is one of them. This may be perfect for your particular needs. It may be limited for others. But this is what we're going to look at in the class because it already is based on top of JavaScript nomenclature and terminology and the paradigm. If we then started to start, hey everyone, let's learn SQL. That's a whole thing in and of itself that's going to take us four weeks. So there's documentation, there's APIs, there's YouTube videos, there's tutorials. It's, it's a very cool project. So any general questions about this? There'll be more time for it and hands-on in the next class, but any general questions? Right, so we'll come back to uh, yes. This is obvious. Uh, it's indexed, right? Uh, it's using index DB as as the internal uh, structure in the web browser. Or do you mean like the indexed databases? Um, I have to check the documentation exactly um, because it's more of a key value pair. That's why I'm saying that it's not relational. So it's a more of a key-value pair that works in JSON format, but internally in the web browser, it's saved as an index DB kind of object. So it's not a relation. No, not relation. All right, so we'll do a couple little things and then we'll wrap up the class. Um, I just want to confirm on my project. On mine, I know I've got an issue, so you should check yours as well. Let's go back to our config XML file. Back on our project root, config XML. Let's edit the config XML file at the root. Take one more quick look to see if everything looks good here specifically. In my case, I forgot to change my package ID. It's still com.compost.basic. So if you're using my particular example that I put into the network folder, you should take a moment to edit that so that there's no conflict. Eventually, when we get to the point, and I'll remind us again, when we get to the point where we publish this for real to the App Store, if you choose, I'm going to rem remind us about this so that it has your name, so that your app does not conflict with my app, and vice versa. 
So at this point right here, my SDCE. This is the final version up to this point of the app, so I'll put the date here also. It's the 30th. It's still Android version code 1. I'm still building that as version 1. And my description looks good, and author looks good. I'll, I'll mention one more little thing. Um, if you, it's very subtle, but if you browse your app, sometimes on some screens, when you transition from screens, I pull it up here and see if it's visible. When you transition between some screens, uh, specifically when we when you go into the um, into the right now we're in the index HTML file, remember. And when we go over to the get directions, we go to dir. See that gray screen that flashed for a moment, and then we got to this screen with the nice blue. We can, and if I go back, we're going to see the gray a moment, and then back there. We can set a background, a default background color between those transitions to make it even more seamless. We never set that color, therefore there's a little bit of a flash of a default generic color between those screens. So we can set a background color so that we don't see that. We don't see that, you know, that seam. Um, let me bring it up here. Let's see, where do I have it? Well, I'll just refer back to Cordova. Cordova in the config XML documentation, there's, a, there's an option that I can add that sets a, a default background color. And it's useful for us because it'll stop that little glitch. Disallow or scroll. Here we go, background color. So we're going to add this property in a moment. Preference, name, background color, capital B, capital C, and then a value. This value is actually also with transparency. So it is, uh, it is a, a, a hexadecimal color rather than an RGB color. And it's, it's prefaced with 0x to show that it's hexadecimal. Then it's got a transparency bit right here. And then it's got the RGB. So this is a fully opaque. If it were 000, it would be a transparent color, FFF, fully opaque. And then the actual color, in this case, is a nice bright blue which will look weird on our app. But this is the code, and then I'll fine-tune it so that I have that background color in between my screens. This is going to be added to... I'm going to add it right after disallow over scroll, which is line 21. It's a new preference. Its name is background color, and its value is the color. So it's a fully opaque bright blue color, which is not quite the right color. I need to look up what my particular purple color was, and then I can add it to here, and then I'll have that transition, seamless transition between screens. See that color in my case <coughs> I saved my theme roller theme color so I can bring it back it's that background color which is right there. So if you're using the same purple color that I am, there it is. I'm keeping it fully opaque, so it's FF, and then it's 2E3192. 
That should be the same purple color from screen to screen, and therefore I won't see that gray uh, default background when I go from uh, index HTML over to dir HTML. So I'll let that run, uh, and then I'll show that to you. And um, put a little bit more fine-tune, a little more polish on my app. There's still more to do once we create uh, that database feature uh, with PouchDB. We'll have a, a little bit more of a functional app that can actually do something, save data. The <coughs> data doesn't have to be text. It could technically also be graphical data. Um, the great thing is that it replicates over to an online database as well. And then we'll be talking about if you've ever kind of uh, browsed around some of this output, you might notice here and there that it says something about debug. And then at a certain point, it also says um, something something dot apk. Well, there, the, there's an end result to this building. It's an apk file. It's an Android package file. That's your actual file, that is your whole app. We're going to see where it is buried within our project. And then, of course, we need to talk about once it's all finished, we need to sign the app. We need to sign it as an official developer that this is our app. We vouch for it. It's, 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 from, our, it's from our company or development studio. And that requires creating a key store. It cr requires creating developer credentials. That's free. Eventually, when we get to publishing it on Google Play, that's the part that's not free. But still, creating your cre your developer credentials, that's going to be free. We'll do it together. And then um, oh, what we'll also need to do is uh, we'll eventually, we're, when we're pretty much done with the app, we're going to need to remove all unused plugins. Right now, our project uses every plugin. Camera, vibration, splash screen, contacts, everything. So people, when they want to download it, and it'll tell them, this app wants permission to use this, 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 and this, everything. People are going to say, why does this school app want to use my camera? Is it going to take a picture of me when I'm not looking? So we want to remove plugins toward the end of our life cycle. Uh, that's for later. And so here, if you kind of peeked at this, uh, it shows in my apps, my SDCE platforms, Android build outputs APK, you get android-debug.apk. That's the actual file that your app is. Later on, we have to release it. We have to build it as a release version, a and a real final version, not no longer a debug version. The the app stores will not accept the debug version. That'll be later. I want to see if my cool new color made a nice smooth transition. purple and then the next screen. So subtle, but those little details um, really add the polish to your project. So at this point we'll end the lecture and therefore end the main uh, end part two of our class.